Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Faith Orchard. I am a lecturer in psychology. I'm based at the University of Sussex. Um, and today I'm going to talk with you about sleep and the relationship with anxiety and depression, particularly focusing on adolescents. Uh, which is very much my area of background. So I come from a background in research on adolescent mental health. Um, and a few years ago now that led me down the path of becoming very interested in the role of sleep in adolescent mental health and why sleep might be particularly important. So I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a journey through that um, work today. As Sheena mentioned, um, I'm very happy for people to comment in the chat. I probably can't keep on top of it whilst I'm speaking, but um, I know uh, Vicky and Heather are, are listening as well and they might be able to respond to comments. Um, but I also got a couple of little activities where I'd like you to put your thoughts in the chat. So just familiarize yourself with where it is. Um, and if you are commenting, make sure it's selected to say that other attendees will see it as well so that people can um, benefit from what you're commenting on. Um, okay, right, so let's make a start. So this is kind of, I guess, just the overview of really what I want to cover today. Um, my talk is kind of, well, we're, I think we're due to go on to the second talk at about 10 past four. So I'm aiming to finish around four-ish so that you have time for a, a bit of a break and go and grab a cup of coffee before we carry on. Um, and as Sheena mentioned, I'll, I'll aim to leave a bit of time for questions as well at the end. So that's what we're working towards. And I've split my talk up into two halves, really. First of all, why, why, do, why should we focus on sleep and how does sleep relate to mental health, particularly in adolescence? Um, and then the second half will focus more on the treatment of sleep problems. So uh, psychologi te psychological techniques that are used, um, what I've used in my um, particular uh, sleeping program that I've been working on. Uh, so that's the outline. Let's make a start. So first of all, um, I'd like you just to have a little bit of a think about why sleep is important. Um, so what happens if we get good quality sleep and what happens if we get poor quality sleep? Um, so you can either put your ideas in the chat um, or just have a bit of a think yourself just for um, a few seconds about why, why we might think sleep is important. So yeah, if you're happy to put your ideas in the chat, um, do go ahead and do that. Some really nice ideas coming in already about concentration and mood, energy levels. Yeah. So there's some really nice ideas coming in. Um, just to flag, if you are messaging, make sure that you send it to attendees and panelists so that everybody can see. Um, I'm just going to whiz through and see, see what we've got. So we've got quite a lot of uh, physical comments. So things about um, the immune system um, and health. Uh, heart issues and then we've got things like recovery as well physical rest and then we've got the more I guess psychological effects as well so emotional well-being being able to process what's going on learning and memory that's a really great one um, education yeah really nice topical for our adolescents our social functioning yeah great yeah so both brain and um physical and mental health. Fantastic. Um, so feel free to keep adding them in. I'm going to show you what I had on my slide. Uh, so I think most of the things that people have been um, sharing tap into very much what I had on my list. So we know that poor quality sleep can affect our mood. It can make us irritable. Um, there were a nice couple of comments about being kind of tired and lacking in energy but also not being able to concentrate. So our cognitive functioning is affected um, when we're not sleeping very well. And on the reverse side, we know that if we get a good night's sleep, our mood is going to be better. We can regulate our emotions much better. We can concentrate. Um, and as was mentioned, I think in, in the, uh, one of the comments, this also affects things like memory and learning. So sleep has a really diverse range of impacts. Um, and you'll see, you know, kind of from the suggestions and from the chat as well, that this links in quite heavily with mood um, and well-being. So I just want to, um, not for too long, but just talk through the processes involved in sleep because these are relevant when we come back to thinking about some of our sleep techniques. 
So there's two processes involved in helping us to fall asleep and to wake up. So the first one is what we call sleep homeostasis. This is our drive to fall asleep or the pressure that we build up throughout the day. Um, and the way this process works is very simple. Um, it's basically the longer we're awake, the more tired we become, the more pressure that we build up ready for sleep at night. The second process is the circadian rhythm. Um, now, our bodies have circadian clocks in, in all of our cells so that we know what happens at certain times of the day. And our sleep functioning is, is the same. So we follow a circadian rhythm. Um, so the rhythm basically tells our body that as we get towards the evening, we need to start preparing for sleep. And this results in the body releasing hormones that can help us to sleep. So these two systems work together to help us both fall asleep and wake up. And you'll see the, the graph I've put on the slide just illustrates this visually. So the blue line um, on the top, that's our sleep pressure. So you'll see throughout the day, um, so on the graph, this is going from 7am to 11pm, the sleep pressure is building. And then if you look at the red line, which is the circadian rhythm um, underneath, this is fluctuating um, between the morning and the evening. And the point where the blue line is at its highest and the red line is at its lowest, where we have the biggest gap between those two systems, that's when we get our sleep onset. So we need these systems to be working nicely in parallel for us to be able to get to sleep. And then once our sleep pressure has uh, dissipated um, during the night and our circadian rhythm is going back up into recognizing that it's morning time, that's then when we wake up. So that's the kind of the simple processes behind what's happening and how we get to sleep. I don't want to spend too long on the sleep stages, but just really to touch on them. So during the night, we go through a range of different sleep stages. You're probably familiar with some of these. Um, so we have the stage known as REM or rapid eye movement sleep, which very much as the name dictates, um, this is often recognized by the fact that the eyes move very quickly whilst we're in this phase. Uh, the brain activity during REM sleep is very rapid, very active, uh, much like when we're awake. So there's a lot going on and this is when we're most likely to be dreaming. Then the rest of the stages are the non-REM stages um, and they vary. So the first stage of sleep is the lightest where we might feel almost awake. Um, and the third stage is the deepest where we're really kind of in that um, very, very deep stages of sleep. Um, and these can be differentiated by a range of biological measurements, things like brain activity and heart rate. During the night, we also spend different amounts of time in the different stages of sleep. Um, and this really kind of maps on to what the sleep is actually doing. So um, what's happening in our body and what's happening in our brain. So at the first part of the evening, we spend most of our time in the deeper stages of sleep. Um, whilst our body's kind of recovering and repairing. And then towards the later part of the night, we spend a lot more time in the lighter stages and a lot more time in REM sleep as well. Uh, so you can see that a kind of even through the night, lots of different things are happening and changing as we go through. So that's how we sleep, but why do we bother sleeping? Um, and this is kind of the million dollar question and it's taken a lot of research and a lot of um, experts and biologists and psychologists to try and answer this question. Um, and it was quite famously a quote back um, in the seventies from Professor Alan Rechaff. And, and he said, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it's the biggest mistake evolution has ever made. And the reason really behind this quote is that it was quite hard to identify why sleep was so fundamental. Every single animal on the planet needs to sleep. Um, and without sleep, we become very ill or we can even die without um, any sleep at all. So it, we knew it was crucial, uh, but it was quite hard to know exactly what it was doing and why it was so fundamental. So there's a range of theories that have been proposed over the years as to why we sleep. And initially the theories were very much evolutionary. So the kind of the basics of conserving energy, avoiding danger. Um, but there's various kind of contradictions to that theory, examples of animals where that's not the case. So other theories have then been proposed since then, and these have a bit more evidence. So, and I think this really nicely maps onto the suggestions as well in the comment about, you know, what happens if we get a good night's sleep or a bad night's sleep. So we 
know that sleep's involved in um, cell reproduction and hormone release. So we have that kind of restoration aspect to sleep. We know that lots happening with our memory. So we learn things, we consolidate things, and we also forget things that we don't need anymore whilst we're sleeping. Um, there's also evidence to suggest that our emotions are being kind of recalibrated during the night, depending on what we've been experiencing. So we still don't have the exact answer as to why it's so um, absolutely critical for every animal, but we do know that lots of really important things are happening during the night. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about sleep in childhood because that's, I know it's going to be a focus a bit more for Vicky and Heather's talks, um, but really just to touch briefly on how sleep is changing. Um, so when infants are first born, various things are happening to start establishing sleep. So the body clock is being developed and infants gradually start to produce melatonin themselves, which is the hormone that helps us to fall asleep. Also, as we go from infancy into childhood, we're seeing gradual reductions in the amount of sleep that we need. Um, and during those first years of life, the kind of the main problems that we're most likely to see with sleep tend to be more around uh, the kind of the, the simple aspects of just keeping children safe um, and starting to establish some routines. And then as we go into childhood, so preschool years and the school age years, um, again, we're seeing that continued reduction in how much sleep we need. Um, but we also start to see some other sleep problems starting to emerge. And this could be things like difficulty with getting to sleep. So either insomnia or sleep refusal, or we might see problems during sleeping. So problems with nightmares or, or sleepwalking. Um, so we start these, uh, these different sleep difficulties start emerging in childhood. Now I'm going to focus very much on my talk about teenagers um, and adolescents. And adolescence is a particularly interesting period um, for lots of reasons. So as I said at the start, my background comes from adolescent mental health. And we know during teenage years, adolescents are really susceptible to the onset of lots of different mental health problems. And this figure here really just illustrates the range of ages at which different disorders can emerge. And we can see clustered between 10 and 20, lots of different disorders start becoming quite common. Um, and this difficulty with mental health is also mirrored in the fact that sleep is a particularly tricky time for teenagers as well. So we want to think a little bit about what teenagers need and then what's happening in practice. Um, as with all ages, teenage sleep is going to vary a lot. So each person needs a slightly different amount of sleep and their patterns can differ as well. So we know that we have people who we consider to be the owls, so people who prefer to go to bed later and, and lie in in the morning. And we have the larks, the people who are, are kind of early, you know, early birds, they go to bed earlier and they wake up earlier. Um, and that's the case for adolescents as well. You're gonna get individual variability. So we can't, and we won't expect teenagers to all look the same. But on the whole, what is recommended is that teenagers should be getting between eight and 10 hours sleep a night. And that recommendation is based on what we need for all of those important functions to be happening. So for the um, physical kind of health, um, the repair, but also the cognitive aspects of our functioning as well. So to be able to concentrate on our schoolwork, um, to be able to learn, to be able to function emotionally, we need to be getting about eight to 10 hours sleep. Unfortunately, um, the worldwide kind of evidence suggests that only about a third of teenagers actually get that recommended amount of sleep. So before we even start talking about um, clinical sleep problems, we have massive difficulties with um, sleep in teenagers. Now, the reason for this has been coined really nicely, the perfect storm. And this was by Mary Cascadden back in 2011. Um, and this perfect storm model really starts to tap into the fact that there are a number of factors going on in adolescence that interact and collide to make sleep really problematic during our teenage years. So I'd like to talk you through a few different factors to give you a sense of what's happening for our, our young people. So the first of the factors is the biological ones. So we know teenagers are going through puberty and they're developing physically. But something also happens to sleep biologically during teenage years. So if you remember at the start, I um, 
talked about the circadian rhythm, the fact that we have this clock that tells us what time we need to go to bed and fall asleep. During our teenage years, our clock shifts to later. So we naturally, our bodies naturally aren't ready to fall asleep until later in the evening. Um, and this is a shift we see um, again across all animals. It's not unique to humans um, and it's also unique to teenagers. So as we move into adulthood, our clock goes back again. Um, but just whilst we're in that teenage period, we have this, this delayed um, circadian rhythm. Then we have the psychological factors, and this is really about us going through kind of a transition into independence um, and, you know, kind of figuring out who we are. And going through teenage years, we're likely to be um, relying more on friendships. We might be starting to develop romantic relationships. Um, and also we're probably starting to become more um, embedded into kind of the social media world. And in terms of our sleep, what's happening here is that a lot of our interaction, our communication happens in the evening. So we're online, we're chatting to our friends at night. And again, this is influencing um, what's happening. Also, um, when we're not uh, in lockdown, um, we'd also probably be seeing teenagers going out and actually socialising in person in the evenings as well. Then the final factor is kind of the more societal factors. So what does society do that affects sleep? Um, and there are problems around things like uh, caffeine use, um, you know, drinking caffeine or sugar kind of late into the evening. But the really big societal factor here is, is the obvious one, which is school. So our teenagers have no control over the time that they go to school. We dictate those times. Um, and here is where we get one of our biggest collisions. So we have the societal effect of telling our teenagers that they need to get up at perhaps uh, 7 a.m. to get to school on time but their biological clock doesn't want them to do that and they're tired and they're, they're not ready to get up so we have a real collision here and what happens is that the body clock wants us to go to bed later our alarm clock tells us we have to get up early so we end up with a sleep deficit in the week where we're not getting those eight to ten hours that we really need we also then get this, this third kind of final effect that's happening here with this collision. So during the week, we have this sleep deficit um, where we just can't get the sleep um, that we would be recommended. Then the weekend comes um, and this kind of this build up of sleep loss throughout the week, as well as uh, socialising in the evenings, means we're more likely to have a later night and a longer lie in at the weekend. But then as soon as Monday hits and we're back up getting ready for school, um, we have to shift our body clock back from what we readjusted to at the weekend. And this is known as social jet lag. Um, and the reason for this is that actually the, the physical feeling is a bit like when we have jet lag, when we travel between countries, um, where our body clocks are having to move around. Um, and this is happening week by week for teenagers. So, so far I've spoken about... I suppose the normal teenage difficulties with sleep, um, but what about the more clinical sleep difficulties? So there's a range of problems that teenagers might experience. Um, and I've highlighted some of the most common ones here on the slide. So insomnia is one of the most common problems we see in teenagers. And this is difficulties falling asleep, uh, staying asleep during the night. So teenagers might be waking up in the night and, and finding it hard to get back to sleep, but also waking up too early. So there's a, raise, a range of ways in which insomnia can present itself. Then other problems might include hypersomnia, which is sleeping too much, um, or delayed sleep phase disorder, which is actually when that sleep delay that I've been talking about shifts even further, so much more than the, the kind of the normal circadian shift. And there are many, many other sleep disturbances as well, um, recognised as, as difficulties, but I'm not going to touch so much on the other ones there. I suppose the one that is particularly relevant, especially at the moment, whilst many of us are, are living our lives at home, is circadian reversal, where teenagers' cycle is actually back to front. So they're sleeping during the day and they're up at night. Um, and I'm hearing from families that I work with that this is becoming more common than usual at the moment because there's not a necessarily school dictating what young people are doing. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm really going to focus mostly on insomnia and the ways in which we work with insomnia. Um, but obviously, you know, do feel free to comment in the chat if you're interested in some of the other um, difficulties as well. 
So I want to move on to thinking a little bit about how sleep and mental health problems um, link together. And I guess one important thing to say just whilst we're talking about sleep problems is that these are recognised sleep disorders, but they're also symptoms of many mental health problems. So insomnia in particular is seen as part of the depression diagnosis. It's seen as part of um, multiple anxiety disorders and many other mental health problems as well are characterized by sleep difficulties. So we know that these things co-occur. They time and time again come up together. But I think what's really important for us is to understand more about um, whether or not they influence each other. So does one in, you know, does one trigger the other one to happen? And what happens if we treat one, does the other one benefit? So I want to talk to you about um, an example of a study that has addressed some of these questions. Um, and this is one that I was involved in that came out last year. Um, and this is a really nice study where we were able to look at the ALSPAC data. So some of you might be familiar with, but this was a study done in Bristol back in the uh, 1990s where pregnant women were recruited into the study. They recruited over 14,000 pregnant women at the start of the 1990s. And those women um, and then the children that they had have been followed up ever since. So this is a really wonderful, amazing data set, which has lots of different measures about child development, where we can look at um, questions that we might have about what con you know kind of constitutes healthy development or what might um, influence um, an unhealthy development. So we were able to look at this data set um, to answer some questions about sleep and mental health. So when the children were 15 years, uh, a subset of the sample took part in um, a diagnostic interview about their mental health, and they also completed measures about their sleep patterns and their sleep quality. Um, so in addition to the measures that we have at age 15, we were also able to look at mental health at later time points. So there were measures of anxiety and depression um, later in adolescence, so at age 17, but also into early adulthood at ages 21 and 24. So this meant that we were able to look at whether or not the sleep patterns and the sleep quality happening um, at age 15 predicted future anxiety and depression. So I want to show you some of the data that we found. So we broke up, uh, as I have mentioned, into sleep patterns and sleep quality. And the sleep patterns really refer to our sleep time. So what time did we go to bed? How long were we asleep for? What time did we wake up? And across a range of different um, variables, what we found came out was that the amount of time young people were asleep on school nights in particular was a significant predictor of their anxiety and their depression at all three future time points. So both later in adolescence, but also into their early adulthood, um, how much they were sleeping on school nights at age 15 was a predictor of their mental health. Um, and then with sleep quality, again, we looked at a range of different factors of sleep quality. Um, and this included things like how long it took to fall asleep, um, whether they were tired in the day, whether they were waking up at night. And again, here we found a really consistent pattern where three particular um, aspects of sleep quality were significant predictors. And the ones that came up as being significant were how tired we are, how sleepy we were during the day, whether we were waking at night, and also our perception of our sleep quantity. So did we think we were getting enough sleep? So if we thought we weren't getting enough sleep, that was a significant predictor of our future mental health. What was really nice about the study is that we had these multiple time points, but um, we also found this consistent um, finding. So um, at all three time points, we found the same patterns, which gives us kind of a good indication that these are quite reliable predictors. So I think for me, this, this piece of research was really important um, in adding to a wider range of literature as well that gives us an understanding that sleep in teenage years um, and potentially across other aspects of childhood as well, is not only really important at the time, but it might be important in the future. So this, if we can get in there and improve teenage sleep whilst they're um, in that age range, this might have benefits for, for longer term mental health as well. Okay, so um, I want to move that into the second part of my talk, which is really thinking a bit more about psychological treatment. So what does the evidence tell us about psychological treatments for sleep? Um, 
uh, and how can this help mental health? Um, so I want to just start by broadly uh, giving a bit of an overview into the psychological approaches to sleep problems. Uh, so I said that I'm going to focus mostly on insomnia and the, the psychological approach for insomnia is cognitive behaviour therapy for insomnia. Um, so I would imagine some of you um, are probably familiar with cognitive behaviour therapy um, for a range of different problems. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's very similar for insomnia. So we have you know, the cognitive aspects and the behavioural aspects, um, but they're very targeted when we're talking about insomnia specifically. I've just outlined here in the box the range of aspects, um, the range of techniques that are used as part of a CBTI programme. Um, so first of all, we have the very kind of educational side, um, and this would be covering both traditional psychoeducation, so understanding how we get into negative cycles, but also sleep education. So a bit like I've done today, just outlining what's important to understand about our sleep. Then as we go into the kind of the more uh, active parts of the treatment, the first thing that's really important is to monitor sleep. So to find out actually what the sleep pattern looks like. Um, and this is typically done with sleep diaries. And then we get into our cognitive and our behavioural components. So um, this could include thought challenging and, and with insomnia, this often looks like um, the worries and the beliefs we have about our sleep. So worrying that if we get a bad night's sleep, it means we're going to do really badly at school the next day and we might you know, fail our exams. So the, the kind of the, the uh, catastrophizing or the worrying that might occur as part of a, in a difficulty with insomnia. And then we have our more behavioral aspects as well. So um, I'm not going to talk about these a lot here because I'm going to talk about them as we go through the rest of the talk. Um, but we have uh, sleep hygiene and stimulus control, which are very much about creating good routines and good environments to aid sleep. And then we have the more um, sleep restructure, restructuring aspect. Um, so this is where we're actually dictating what time we should be going to bed or moving our sleep time so that we have the best opportunity to get a really good night's sleep. So I'm going to talk through those in more detail as we go. Um, before we do that, I just want to present a little bit of evidence for you about how these sleep interventions impact mental health. And again, there are a few studies that have done this. I'm just going to show you one example. So this was a meta-analysis that I was involved in a couple of years ago. So here we looked at all the studies that had measured uh, or that had conduct conducted psychological sleep interventions and had measured outcomes for depression in particular. Um, there are similar studies for anxiety as well. Um, and we found 49 studies that had looked at the effect of sleep interventions on depression and we found really large effects. So treating sleep only was a real um, a really good way of actually targeting depression symptoms. One problem that we found was that there was very little research in, in childhood. Um, so there were only four studies that had been done with adolescents. And actually none of those included young people that had um, high levels of depression symptoms. So was, the effects of seeing the change for depression were smaller um, because there wasn't kind of that opportunity to see um, a really large change. So, I mean, for, for me and for other researchers in the field, I think the big thing here was that we need to do more work on this, even though we know it's really important and there's really good evidence for why we should do it. Um, the kind of the, the research really looking at the effects on mental health is still quite limited. OK, so um, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about our sleep programme that we've been using with teenagers, um, which we called the Sleeping Better programme. So this programme was based on CBT for insomnia um, and actually adapted from a brief version of CBTI, which was developed by Jason Ellis, who you can see on the on the slide there. Um, so Jason's original approach, which was designed for adults, um, was done purely as what he called a one shot treatment. So adults were seen once and that was it and then they kind of monitored their improvements over time so we really wanted at this stage I was working in in CAMS and we wanted to develop a program that was going to be suitable for young people with mental health problems we wanted to take this brief ap approach and the reason for this was that um, because young people were presenting primarily with anxiety or depression we wanted to make sure that the intervention wasn't really long um, and, you know, that might then interfere with treatments they would be receiving for um, their kind of their primary problem. So we wanted to take this brief approach. 
but we didn't do one shot. Um, we decided to do various adaptations to the programme. So one of the first things that was important was to build in more sessions. Because we were working with teenagers, we thought it might take a bit more time to Im embed those practices and to get um, the whole family kind of on board uh, with the programme. As I've just mentioned there, family involvement is really important. So um, also, obviously, as part of adolescent work, we had parents included. They came to the, the treatment sessions. Um, and we also had to adapt the program just to be more kind of adolescent friendly. But other than those simple adaptations, um, the rest of the techniques are, are broadly quite similar. So our program very much is um, a behavioural treatment. So we don't target those cognitive components that I mentioned earlier about worries. Um, and there's quite good evidence that these more behaviorally focused treatments are, are still really effective um, at treating sleep problems. So these are the three components that I highlighted earlier. So the sleep hygiene, the stimulus control, and the sleep rescheduling, which is really kind of the main focus of our content. Um, before I just talk through those techniques, I just wanted to show you how we monitor sleep. So this is an example of a sleep diary um, and the young people would fill this in each week prior to their session. Um, you'll see that, uh, I don't know if you can read the questions, don't worry if, if you can't um, see them in too much detail, but essentially there's seven questions that, ask, that address quite simple concepts to do with sleep. So what time did you get into bed? Uh, what time did you turn the lights off and try to go to sleep? Um, how long did it take you to fall asleep? And so on and so on about the rest of the night as well. And then from those kind of simple seven questions, we can calculate two really important um, numbers. Total sleep time. So how much time is somebody getting overall um, and the amount of time in bed? And these two numbers together are really important because they can help us to understand a bit more about the insomnia. So is somebody spending a lot of time awake in bed, not sleeping? So that's the way in which we monitor to sleep. Um, traditionally, we've done it with paper and we're now moving to doing it in a more online format to be a bit more teenage friendly, um, which is obviously really important. OK, so um, I want to talk through then those three behavioural uh, techniques for the sort of the remainder of the session. And then I want to show you some data on our programme. Um, some of these things are really obvious and you'll probably be aware of some of them. Um, I think with teenagers, the difficulty comes in actually implementing them rather than uh, knowing that they exist. So we've already touched a little bit on some of these. So sleep hygiene is very much about getting ourselves into the right state for sleep in the evening. So there's things that we can be doing during the day, like avoiding caffeine in the evening or the afternoon, making sure that we're active and that we're getting exercise, um, making sure that we're getting natural light. All those things can be done during the day. Um, and then in the evening, it's going to be more about kind of winding down. So making sure we have a comfortable environment, um, reducing the use of electronics in the evening. So we tend to say half an hour to 45 minutes um, before bed, try and switch those things off. Um, and having things like relaxing routines, perhaps um, a little daily diary of what you've achieved if, if people are struggling to, to switch off. Now, like I said, the problem really comes here when with teenagers and some of these things need to be negotiated. Um, electronics is the big one. Um, and there's not an easy way to do this. And often it's about finding a good middle ground. So, you know, it might be about letting teenagers use electronics in the evening, but making sure that they are doing it in a different room um, and that they are switching it off and, uh, um, when they're actually getting into bed and trying to sleep. And again, things like, you know, just um, having a good bedroom environment, these things can be quite difficult and need a lot of negotiation. I think very much the, the nice thing about the CBTI programme overall, not just this version, is that um, it's really tailored to the individual and you can focus on the things they want to work on. And I think with teenagers, that's really particularly important. Um, one other aspect of sleep hygiene that I wanted to touch on um, again, because it quite often is a problem in, in teenagers, is napping. Um, so we use this pizza dough analogy in our program. So the idea is, is that our sleep is like a pizza dough when it's all contained into one um, kind of one block. Um, it's nice and solid and it works really well. Once you start stretching it, it's OK to stretch it a bit. But if you stretch it too far, then you start to get tears. And the idea here is if you start stretching out and sleeping during the day, 
you're not going to be able to contain your sleep into one window and it's going to be more broken. Um, and oh, there's my text for that on the screen. Sorry, didn't realize I had the extra text there. Um, so the idea is, is that we're more likely to have these, these breaks in the night if we're napping during the day. And the other thing that's important here is if you think back to the start when I was talking about how we get to sleep, if we're napping, it also interferes with our sleep pressure. So if remember, I presented this graph. If the blue line is our sleep pressure building up, if we're napping, it, it's going to drop back down again. So by the time we get to the night, we don't have this lovely big gap between our two lines. Um, so not only are we likely to have broken sleep, but we also might, like, might be more likely to find it hard to get to sleep. So we really want to be avoiding napping as well. OK, so the second aspect then of the behavioural techniques is stimulus control. And this is rather than the focus on us, which is what we do in sleep hygiene, this is about the environment that we sleep in um, and creating a really good association between our bedroom um, and being asleep. And the thing here is that we don't want our bedroom to become associated with being awake and active. And again, this seems obvious, but the problem we have is that when we do this with teenagers, their bedrooms are so important to them and they do a lot of their life in their bedroom, especially at the moment where they're possibly even doing their schoolwork in their bedroom. So again, it really comes back to negotiation here. So where possible, we want to be ideally doing schoolwork or homework in a different room. If that's not possible, again, it might be about negotiating. So is there a desk in the bedroom? If that's not the case, can they even just have a beanbag somewhere else in the bedroom? What we don't want to be do is doing is working in bed because then our brain starts to make the association that when we get into bed, we do work and that's really active and that's going to make our brain wake up. Um, again, things like watching TV, ideally, we don't want to be doing it in the bedroom, but that's probably not realistic for many teenagers. So like I said, with the last point, really, it's about negotiation. So can we watch TV on a beanbag um, or on a chair rather than in bed? Um, so this all comes down to this association. We want to create this lovely association where as soon as we get into bed, our body knows that we're going to be going to sleep um, so that it can kind of relax and wind down rather than wake up. Linked to this then, um, one of the uh, important aspects of CBT is knowing that if we're lying in bed awake in the night, just lying there um, and staying there wide awake isn't going to be helpful. So we have this, what we call the 20 minute rule, um, where what we advise is that if you're trying to get to sleep and you've been awake for about 15, 20 minutes, you should get up. Um, otherwise, this then interferes with this stimulus control where we start to create an association with bed about being awake um, and stressed and worried about not being able to get to sleep. So actually getting out of bed, going to do something else and then coming back and trying again. And um, I wondered if we could just have a bit of a think. Um, and again, feel free to use the chat and I'll have a look at some of your ideas about what sort of things could we do whilst we are out of bed that would be helpful. Because remember, what we don't want to do here is suddenly wake ourselves up and be really active and engaged. So what kind of things might we do in that little window while we're up and out of bed? Have a bit of a think. And like I said, post in the chat if you want to. I'm going to open it up and see um, what people have been saying. Some really nice ideas coming in. Yeah, this is fantastic. So I'm just going to um, kind of talk through some suggestions. Feel free to keep commenting. I'll, I'll kind of work my way through them. So um, we've got quite a lot of suggestions about um, reading, which is a, a really nice one. And I did see a comment a little bit later on about whether or not reading is a good idea. Um, and this is a really important point, actually. Reading is fine. Um, as long as it's not really stimulating. So what we don't want to do is get gripped by a horror that we then can't fall asleep from. So it, again, it's about finding the middle ground. Um, and I think I did see later through the list a suggestion about reading something boring. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, is a really good idea if it works for you, something that's not too stimulating. What else have we got? Colouring is a really nice one. Uh, yeah, reading with a, a low light. Um, yeah, perhaps having a herbal tea, deep breathing, having a warm drink, listening to gentle music. Yeah, it's really good. So again, it's about kind of keeping it too, um, not too stimulating. Um, yoga, it's a really nice one. Looking out the window, listening to quiet music. Yeah, these are all really, really good. Um, 
podcast is a really good one um again because it avoids screens so one of the difficulties here is that you obviously again don't want to be doing things that um aren't helpful so a podcast can be a really good one stroking a pet that's really nice yeah sewing is a really good one as well so i think um these are yeah brilliant really brilliant ideas and i think again the the trick here is to engage with the um, teenage about what they're going to want to do um, and this is where it's really important there's no point telling them to go and read a book if they don't like reading um, so will a podcast work will um, coloring work I know there was sort of a, a phase where people had the those really amazing um, kind of color books where the pictures were all kind of sketched and you just colored them in um, things like that can be really nice audio books are really good suggestion as well so it's really about that negotiation finding what works for you I'm just going to close my chat window, otherwise I'll um, I'll get distracted by it. Um, yes, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, really good ideas there. So the final part of the behavioural techniques is um, what we call sleep scheduling. So it's really important to rate, um, maintain a consistent sleep wake cycle. And this again comes back to the body just knowing what's happening day to day. You want the body to be familiar with when it needs to go to bed and when it needs to wake up. And what is quite important here when you're dealing with insomnia is that this needs to be consistent both in the week and at the weekend. This can again be quite hard for teenagers because they often, as I've mentioned earlier, have quite um, early starts for school um, and they're knackered at the weekend. Um, so it's generally accepted that a, a little lie-in is okay, but it shouldn't be too long. Um, and we still want to be trying to keep as much routine as possible. Um, but the kind of the basic rule is, is having that routine. But if we are dealing with more um, significant insomnia, we might also use what we call sleep restriction. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I've got some resources at the end. You can go and read if you're interested in a bit more detail. But essentially what we do with sleep restriction is we um, we use the sleep diaries to identify the total sleep time, the average total sleep time across the course of the week. And we essentially map that total sleep time to the perfect window. So we work out what time the young person needs to get up for school um, and then we work backwards. So if they need to get up at seven and they're getting seven hours sleep on average because they're waking up or they're you know struggling to find it, um, struggling to fall asleep, then we would say, okay, so bedtime is going to be midnight. Um, and then that's when we introduce a bit of restriction and we push that bedtime back a little bit later. So we'd now be saying quarter past 12 rather than 12. And this is a really, um, it's a really hard thing to do. And, and what happens is uh, individuals become very exhausted. Um, but it's this kind of this exhaustion and, and squeezing the sleep to be really good quality so that it's consistent and there's no nighttime waking. Um, and once the quality starts to improve and the insomnia goes away, um, then we start adding sleep back in. So we would add time on until we finally get to the kind of the perfect medium. So there are, like I said, there's more kind of specifics as to how this is done, um, which I'm not going to talk through today. But um, this is a really helpful technique for people who are really, really struggling with insomnia. And we have used it as well in our in our practice. Um, just a note of caution on it, uh, I wanted to just highlight is um, particularly when you're working with mental health problems, which which we do, um, we need to be quite careful if we are ever doing sleep restriction because it can lead to some rumination because obviously we're, we have people up late potentially on their own in the evening um, and they might be ruminating um, and particularly if we're dealing with things like depression. We also might have some problems with um, an increase in initial suicidal ideation. So we only ever do this if we are confident we can keep people safe um, and that there's, you know, parents and family involved to support young people. Um, so just want to highlight that, you know, we don't kind of take this on lightly. It needs to be done carefully. OK, so the last thing that I want to show you is just some evidence from our programme. Um, and this is actually looking at the context of mental health problems. Um, so this is a case study from when we first adapted the programme. Um, so we worked with um, a young girl who, for the purpose of the, the case study, we've called Sophia. Um, so Sophia was 16 when we saw her um, and she'd actually initially come to uh, our um, our service. So at the time I was I was based in Reading as part of the anxiety and depression in young people service there. 
And Sophia came to see us and she was experiencing problems with um, multiple anxiety disorders. And she'd been treated for anxiety, um, but unfortunately it became quite apparent that her insomnia had been going on for a long time and it wasn't getting better. Um, and although she recovered from her anxiety disorders alongside some quite significant insomnia, which you'll see in a second, she also started experiencing depression. Um, as part of her depression, which is, and this is common in teenagers, we saw problems with self-harm and some active suicidal thoughts as well. So given the quite serious insomnia, we offered her the Sleeping Better programme um, and that was going to be followed up with treatment for her depression. So this is just some simple data on Sophia's sleep. Um, so if you just have a look at the table there, the, the two numbers in, in uh, the red boxes are the ones I really wanted to highlight. So before we did any treatment with Sophia, it was taking her over two hours, in fact, two hours, 20 minutes on average to fall asleep at night. Um, so really kind of serious, what we call sleep onset latency, time to fall asleep. Um, she wasn't really waking up much in the night, a little bit, um, on average about 25 minutes. Um, but it really was that initial insomnia that she was struggling with most. And the consequence of that um, was that she was really getting significantly less sleep on average than we would want a teenager to be getting. So she was getting under six hours sleep um, when we first saw her. So I explained the program earlier, but we um, we worked with Sophia over a number of weeks and we had um, her parents were able to attend three of the sessions with her. Um, so again, just some data I want to, to highlight to you. Um, again, don't worry too much about all of the numbers in here. I'll flag the key bits. But what we really see is that um, in that first week where we give um, Sophia and her family all of the, the guidance around what can help. Um, and with Sophia, we were doing sleep restriction um, within just a week by the following week, she was taking five minutes to fall asleep rather than two hours. Um, and this really comes down to the fact that we're being really strict with her about when she can go to bed. Um, so we see that immediate um, reduction in insomnia. And if you remember, I kind of briefly mentioned once your sleep quality starts to get better, you can add time back in. Um, you can then see over the course of the, the six weeks that we saw her, um, she was gradually getting more sleep each week. Um, so again, by the time kind of towards the end of the program, she's not at the stage that we would want a teenager to be, but um, she's learning the tools herself to gradually increase her time. So um, we were really pleased with her progress over the course of the program. She also wasn't waking up in the night um, anymore either. Um, so there were some nice self-reported benefits from Sophia. Um, so she reported that she was no longer self-harming um, and she stopped having suicidal thoughts. I want to just um, highlight here, I guess, that I wouldn't say that was necessarily um, solely down to the sleep intervention. We were also um, doing risk management with Sophia to make sure that she was safe. Um, so it's possible it was a combination of factors that were helping with that. Um, she reported that she was not as tired in the day and she'd stopped drifting off at school, um, which were really nice positives. Also, what I think was um, really reassuring is that she was feeling better in herself and actually decided um, that she didn't need to go ahead with the treatment for depression. Um, so we saw this kind of really nice broader effect um, across her well-being. Um, we were also really interested in kind of acceptability with the program um, and some really nice quotes from Sophia about how it not only supported her, but it also was useful for her mum. And this real focus on improving sleep quality first um, and then starting to introduce um, more sleep quantity. OK, so I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, I just wanted to highlight three resources that um, are targeted quite differently. These are all books. Um, these are all really fantastic. So um, a nice book by Alice Gregory, which is kind of general sleep science. Um, and this covers childhood, uh, infancy, actually, all the way up to um, older adulthood. But it really nicely covers all of the um, childhood stages. And that's generally about the science of sleep. Um, for anyone who is interested in um, treating sleep problems or who works clinically, there's a really nice book um, by Alison Harvey that covers all of these techniques in a bit more detail. Um, and for anyone who might be a parent themselves or working with parents, uh, there's a nice self-help guide as well, 
about supporting children with sleep um, if parents want to read a bit more themselves. So hopefully um, all some some good resources that can be used. So um, it's five to four and I think um, uh, we had said that we would take any kind of specific questions now. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Time for you to take some questions from people. Yes. And then when we've done that, we'll have a little five minute break so people can stretch their legs before we go on to the next presentation. So um, we've got about 10 minutes if you'd like to take questions from yeah. people or start a discussion. Yeah, great. Sounds brilliant. So Sheena, what's the best way to do it? Um, is there stuff in the Q&A or do we want people to, to pop uh, their hand up? Or stuff in chat. I mean, um, <laughs> <we've> got, <laughs> I can tell you what some of the questions are. So yeah. um, anybody whose question doesn't come up, please feel free to retype it into chat um, because there is a lot of information in here. But one of the questions that's come up is people, uh, children rather, with neurodevelopmental issues I wonder if you could say something about sleep and the relevance of the techniques that you've talked about for children with neurodevelopmental issues. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And um, I'm going to be a little bit cautious because it's not my area of expertise because um, I work primarily with anxiety and depression and sleep. But um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know sleep is a huge problem in you know neurodevelopmental difficulties. I'm not sure whether or not Vicky or Heather are going to touch on some of those problems in their talks um, later on. But I mean, as far as I'm aware, yeah, the techniques um, would still be applied. I mean, generally, the techniques are obviously um, helpful across the board for all ages, not just focused on young people as well. Um, but there possibly are other more specific techniques that can be used. But I would want to be careful about suggesting them in case I um, um, didn't get them accurate. Uh, and I see Heather's just posted to say she's going to talk about this as well later. So that's great. OK. Um, another question that's come up is um, whether when you're actually carrying out your sleep interventions, mm -hmm. um, are you relying on self-report from young people, self-report from parents, or do you use any kind of technology? That's a fantastic question. So we typically in treatment um if it's treatment only and not necessarily research we would be using sleep diaries um and sleep questionnaires if we're running research and we're fortunate to have some funding um then we might also use acti watches um so these are just um movement measurement essentially that tells you what you know when someone's active and we compare that with the sleep diaries to provide a slightly more kind of whole picture of what's happening um, it's a really interesting area. People have quite different opinions on this. And I think biological, in my opinion, biological measures can tell us quite a lot. But when you're dealing with things like insomnia and well-being, the subjective reports for me are the most important. So we want somebody to feel like they're OK or if they're not, we need to know that. So I think um, my preference would be for the subjective, but I think if there is any opportunity to draw on some um, more uh, objective measurements, then that is obviously always going to be helpful if you can. Another question that's come up um, is about the programme. So <laughs> people are interested in knowing how they might be able to access it. Is it something that has been manualised? Is it something that's available to buy? Is it something that is available through CAMS? How do people access this? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I mean, unfortunately, we're um, still quite early in the stages of evaluating the programme, so it's not um, you know, available uh, across the country yet. At the moment, we are, we've done the initial testing in CAMS um, and we're now hoping to, to do some pilot work in schools as well. And, and hopefully at that stage, we'll be on a, in a position where we can um, uh, evidence it and then roll it out a bit wider. But I think the thing to say here is that these principles are all drawn from a, a traditional CBTI programme. Um, and I'm pretty sure Heather and Vicky's programmes also include similar techniques as well to the ones I've talked about. So I think it's more about finding the best access in your area to um, CBT type techniques. And 
unfortunately it's one of these things that differs massively depending on the region that you're in so some regions are fortunate and they have sleep services others might not um some regions will invest in kind of online programs and others don't so it's kind of knowing a little bit more about your area um but i would imagine we can probably find out a little bit more about access when we we hear from um vicky and heather who i know have also got programs that are up and running uh, another question uh, that's come up is um, whether you can give us some idea of just exactly how common these problems are. So um, sleep problems on the one hand, are they very common? Are they not very common? Um, and just how common, what's the incidence of the relationship between sleep disorders or sleep problems and anxiety and depression? in adolescence so yeah. do they always co-occur is it common that they co-occur or is it just something that happens uh, occasionally yeah okay so um so i think as i presented uh, quite early on in the slides not getting enough sleep is really common so about two-thirds of teenagers won't get the sleep that they're recommended but that's not necessarily at the stage of being a a disorder or an, an insomnia type problem. Um, in adolescence in particular, it sits, depending on how you measure it, this is always the difficulty with any mental health or any um, kind of uh, disorder type problem, the rates will vary. Um, but we think we're talking somewhere in the region of about 20%-ish um, in teenagers that will experience insomnia. So it's still quite common. Um, but again, like I said, it, it will vary depending on what you're actually measuring. Some rates will be higher and some rates will be a little bit lower. In terms of mental health problems, it depends on the mental health problem. So some recent work that we've done with depression actually found that sleep problems were, well, I say this is we, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Um, I have done some work on this, but there was a really brilliant study with loads, uh, the largest sample that was done in a treatment trial for depression where they looked at the prevalence of sleep. Um, and they found that sleep problems were more common than low mood in terms of the depression profile. And actually, I think it was about 90% of the teenagers in the trial had sleep problems. Um, so it's really common in depression. It's less common in anxiety compared to depression. I can't remember the stats off my top of my head, but um, it's it is common still, um, more common than you would see in the normal population or the you know the non anxious population, um, but not quite at the the level that we see in depression where it always occurs. Um, it will be some young people, but not all of them. Yeah, we we've talked about the impact on young people and the benefits for young people of having good sleep hygiene, but sleep's a family issue, and I wonder if you've done any work on evaluating the impact of improvements in adolescents or children's sleep on the family on the parents. Well, that's such a brilliant question. Um, unfortunately, no, it's not something that I've done yet. But um, I think you know as you know, has been highlighted there The we know that teenage sleep affects the whole family. And I think, you know, it's parents, it's siblings, you know, if you've got children in the same room, there's so many dynamics going on um, with young people. I think, I mean, at the stages that I'm at with my programme, we kind of got to get the initial baseline data, but I'd be so interested to see whether or not this generalises and supports the whole family and actually program that I'm working on at the moment we want to create some videos for people to have at home that just reminds them of the techniques um, and I was thinking about this the other day that you know that feels like something that the whole family can just have access to you know as long as it's easy to watch and easy to understand um, so no I, I don't know if there is any literature on that yet but it would be a brilliant thing to explore further find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health visit www.acamh.org